This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Anton Zeal. He is the chairman of the Association for Cryptocurrency Enterprises and Startups in Singapore. So also Axis. It's quite, quite, quite a name. Uh, but yeah, basically an association for, for kind of blockchain startups and companies in, in Singapore. He's also the CEO and co-founder of CoinPip, which is a blockchain startup out there, and a co-founder of InfoCorp, which is doing some interesting things about another kind of blockchain project out there. So Anson is joining us today to talk a bit about some of these projects, but also about you know blockchain in Asia, what's going on there, what's going on in Singapore. Uh, we know, of course, everyone reads about that, but lots of activities over there, but it's something that we have not covered a lot on the podcast. So I really look forward to diving a bit into that. So yeah, it's, uh, it's good to have you on the show, Anson. Thank you for having me. So I guess we can get started there, right? So you have been involved in the blockchain space also for quite a while. How did you originally uh, end up becoming involved in the blockchain industry? So my background is in computer science. I've uh, been working at an um, accounting software firm for quite a while, and then founded my own hedge fund. And then in 2013, um, got to know about Bitcoin while playing a game, uh, World of Warcraft, is, is, is back then. And then I, wasn't, I was quite shocked. I thought it was just another sort of uh, gaming currency. But once I actually read the white paper, I was actually very interested in it. So being in computer science and also in uh, finance, uh, Bitcoin was just right at the intersection, uh, fintech for me. So from then on, it was uh, a lot of work, working um, as a startup and working, talking to the government, engaging with the government. It's been, yeah, it's been quite a while already. So at that time, uh, I guess you lived already in Singapore. Was there anything going on? Were there activities? So uh, the startup activity was already brewing. So um, I, I, I am originally from Hong Kong and then because uh, my family's here in Singapore, so we moved over here. Uh, but we were already comparing the different startup ecosystems because as a hedge fund uh, perspective, uh, we're seeing a lot of activity, a lot of money going into startups instead of going into stocks, especially back then with all the Facebooks uh, and all the Googles raising all the funds. I thought we should have a look into this space. Uh, so we have seen that uh, the Singapore government has been really pushing for a lot of different grants, uh, a lot of VCs coming into Singapore back then, even in 2013, before fintech became big. So um, innovation was basically uh, the key uh, for, the, uh, for Singapore, whereas in Hong Kong, we, I don't really see it only until recently. Hong Kong has always been a hub where fund management, uh, traditional companies, gateway to China. That was all the main marketing words. But where Singapore, it's uh, innovation, uh, need the Singapore to become a very different sort of Singapore to the old generation. That, that was what I was marketing, and it, they do walk the talk here. And, and just so to clarify, but at the time in 2013, what was there in terms of startups? I mean, I do remember there was a company called uh, 8 you know, in Singapore. Uh, can you talk a bit, like, what was there? Were there different companies? What was the connectivity? What was the interest? Did, like, meetup, startup, like, spe specifically around Bitcoin and blockchain? Yes. So uh, back then, there were a few companies, including Ibit. So uh, Ibit was actually not the first uh, Bitcoin exchange back then, now cryptocurrency. Uh, Bitcoin exchange back then, there was actually another earlier one started by a local here. And... Um, the activity back then was actually very, um, how do you say it? Even the government thought, oh, this is nothing that big. Let these guys have a look. But Ibit was trying very hard to talk to the government to explain to them the next, the big potential of cryptocurrencies. This was back in 2013. But the government here was still, I guess, not even at the learning stage. They were just thinking that it was just another sort of startup trying to come to us to explain what it is. Little did we know that they started learning quite a lot 
until in around March 2014. That was when the central bank here, MAS, uh, first issued a note um, announcement saying that we will start uh, looking and regulating virtual currencies. That was the term that they used. But in terms of regulating, it's um, mostly on the uh, anti-money laundering and the counter-terrorist finance sort of um, a framework when regulating, not as a currency itself. So back then, even when Access, which started uh, in uh, May 2014, when we spoke to the government then, they were still in a wait and see mode. They, I know they were already researching, uh, but they were not really seeing any big implication affecting the financial system here in Singapore. So um, uh, back then was just all, all research. And even when the hacks uh, happened in elsewhere, for example, in Mt. Gox and many different exchanges, uh, Singapore only just issued notices. Uh, but it was very obvious in 2015, things were ramping up. Governments now are doing, the uh, Singapore government now is doing their own, uh, trying out their own e-Singapore dollar, which is the Project Ubin. Uh, so definitely they're using this project to understand the blockchain ecosystem even more. But to answer your question back then, uh, it was the entrepreneurs that started trying to approach the government first, but the uh, government was only just starting to see a glimpse of it, but they weren't really active back then in 2013 and 2014. Okay, so it's, it sounds like the, the Singapore government and sort of has a, you know, a, a very hands-off approach to, to regulating these, uh, these new technologies and, 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 and more of a proactive approach. At least that's the impression that, that, that we get from here. Is, is this historically sort of how they've also looked at fintechs you know, in, the, in the early 2000s? Uh, it, are there similarities to how these authorities are handling sort of blockchain with regards to other technologies that may have come before it? Uh, you're right. So Singapore is a very pro-business uh, sort of country. Even in the recent national budget, uh, how they explain where the money will be uh, spent, uh, the whole stance was being very pro-business, uh, pro-innovation. And uh, the managing director of the central bank here already said very clearly that innovation will always front-run regulation. Um, so in terms of if you compare to other central banks, yes, the fear here doesn't set in quickly. They're not fearful of new change. Uh, they just want to make sure that when there's new um, systems or new innovation that comes in, once it becomes very big, then they want to make it more orderly. But if there's uh, people trying out new things, they're very happy for people uh, to try things out, as long as it follows the framework that what Singapore wants to, uh, wants to do. Do you have any uh, insights, like in the sort of, like coming from Europe, that's a, that's a very interesting standpoint, right? Like from the European perspective. Um, can, can you talk about maybe what uh, economic or cultural reasons are behind this sort of approach? Yes. So um, if you think about it, Singapore was uh, uh, basically, if you know the history just in short, was sort of like a breakaway from Malaysia back in the 1960s. Uh, so... Uh, Singapore does not have any natural resources. Uh, the only thing that they had was nearly less than 3 million people. So people were the only resources. So how the founder of the country, uh, Mr. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew founded it, was uh, trying to make sure that people uh, do uh, work hard, uh, protect the country, uh, need to find new ways of attracting more capital. So now that our founder has just, uh, of the country has just passed away in 2015, now with the new leaders um, of this country are trying to push it to the next level by saying, what can we do uh, that is different? So but Singapore is doing things not on the perspective because they want to take advantage of it, but it's more like they have no choice. No choice, what I mean by that is they have to innovate. If they are just staying still, um, doing, uh, doing nothing, only plain old investing, they basically saying Singapore would not have another chance. No one, they would not get a bailout. So the, the point here is that if they see an opportunity, it works well, Singapore would want to take advantage of it. So that's, uh, that's why it links to the part where we're saying innovation definitely has to trump regulation because they, if regulation comes up in front of everything, then they can't see any new sort of innovation that may help the country in the long run. Interesting. And can you also talk about the, the role that Singapore plays? I mean, like, historically, Singapore has been positioned very 
much as uh, as a trading hub and as a hub for commerce, uh, you know, dating back centuries. Now, with the rise of fintech and, and these other technologies, can you talk about you know Singapore's particular role as a hub uh, moving forward? So it's actually on the national agenda for fintech to grow big. But as we know, fintech has many different legs. Uh, blockchain is only one of them. So there's like crowdfunding, robo advisory, even a bit of uh, cybersecurity. So the whole fintech uh, leg is what uh, uh, the government here wants to push. Uh, because they see it's just the next evolution to themselves because they are the financial center in, in Asia, one of the financial centers. So the next step, obviously, uh, to the government is to push financial innovation, which is fintech. Okay? Uh, so blockchain definitely is one of the pushes, but it's, uh, it's also the reason why Access, for example, doesn't uh, merge, in, like in a very blunt way of saying, uh, with Singapore Fintech Association is because Blockchain is not only just it's not only fintech. You can go into insure tech, gaming, or whatever you want. It's just a it's just a platform. Where Singapore Fintech Association is focusing on the different areas of fintech, and only blockchain is a subset of the whole whole layer that they have. Uh, so basically, uh, what Singapore wants to do is the next, they're trying to push the next step. After now, the financial. Uh, uh, after the financial crisis, we have seen the fund flows into private investments much more. Even the, uh, for example, the sovereign wealth fund here called Temasek, uh, many of the investments are basically large unicorns. And they are seeing that the IPOs and all that will definitely be delayed, will definitely grow less. And uh, seeing how things are moving, uh, they are also looking into how the crypto space, uh, people using the crypto space to raise money, and uh, not just looking at the old ways of, of doing things. So basically, not only for um, capital fundraising, but also how to make Singapore as a smart nation, which is also their uh, main agenda as well. So Singapore has this reputation that it's a favorable place for blockchain startups. Uh, in terms of regulation, can you speak a bit about, you know, what are some of the, you know, are there particular regulatory policies or what are the kind of approaches that uh, Singapore takes? So uh, I need to, because everyone is saying the same thing, so I need to get the context right. Uh, Singapore looks like it's a very favorable place for, for blockchain startups. Uh, the main reason uh, is because, uh, for example, when they talk about the Securities and Futures Act, uh, what is concerns is a security, what's not. They, they will say ABCD is a security, uh, but EDFG is not. They will be very clear in their actual um, legislation. Unlike the US, US has this line that we all know, if it smells like a security, looks like a security, it is, it is a security. This stance is very different with the US where they are being much more blurred in thinking what a security is. They can even blanket the whole thing. So it's just that uh, for Singapore, they are very active in saying what, it, what a security is. And therefore, if people know and are clarified to know what it is, then for example, all the utility tokens that come in uh, will not be within, as long as uh, they don't function as what the Singapore law says. However, however uh, even though uh, they are being very upfront with the, uh, the legislation on the Singapore uh, Securities and Futures Act, they have been very clear in saying that anti-money laundering law um, uh, frameworks and policies must be in place for anything virtual currencies. So most of the um, access members that did ICOs, actually nearly all now, uh, would have to do whitelisting, have to do KYC, uh, not like the very first ICOs where you just put in an address and then you can start putting in your investments. Uh, this is this is a no no now because if you just do that, it's very hard to fulfill the AML uh, standards that Singapore wants. So Singapore is happy to see new innovation. Like I'm in very close chat with the uh, central bank colleagues uh, to the point where we even use WhatsApp to ask questions to so that can get the information they can get the information very quickly from me, even with the enforcement agencies as well. Uh, so we're at that level when we're when speaking, but obviously when we are. Uh, have something more serious, we have to sit down and meet with them uh, face to face. Uh, but yeah, the thing about Singapore, which I find super interesting, is that they will actually come down to the grassroots to meet with the people to understand what's going on. 
not many central banks are actually like this. Uh, so the main difference, as you can see, is one, they are very clear in what they say it, some, uh, for example, a security is. Uh, they will not blur the line. Uh, and two is, once there's something new that comes about, they actually come down to talk to you. So we're very, that's why we, in terms of WhatsApp casually, just to understand what's going on, uh, we talk to the central bank, talk to the enforcements very normally on WhatsApp. You, you talk to the regulars on WhatsApp? Hey, it's, they actually do. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> Singapore has a very different way. Um, MES is not just the central bank. MES is, has many different arms where, in a way, uh, in US, there are many different uh, regulators that you need to approach. Whereas in Singapore, once you approach MES, MES says yes, okay, then basically everything is a go. Okay, so within MES, there are many different pockets. Uh, for example, there's the FinTech ecosystem, uh, FinTech and Innovation Group, which deal with, deals with all the FinTech developments. And within that, there are three groups. There is the ecosystem development, there's the regulation development, so de developing new uh, regulation, and there's a compliance. Okay, so the compliance is obviously Com, uh, complying with all the new regulations that come about. Okay, so um, what I'm trying to say is it's a, basically a one-stop shop. Once you can talk to them, they understand uh, from the top down, then everything can be very smooth. So obviously the trade-off is because they are the everything, it sometimes can take longer to go to every single um, uh, level to get what you want. Okay, but in, on the other hand, like the US, there are many different regulators you need, you need to go to. If you have one regulator that says yes, maybe you can go with, go with that regulator and start doing your startup according to that regulation. But unlike the, the US right now, is many different regulators have different regulations and different definitions of what blockchain is. So this, is, this has, become, has become a very challenging po um, point for the startups there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a very great, that's a great point, right? And, and just as you bring that up, right, in the last days, there were, you know, I think the SEC saying basically everything is a security at the same time, like FinCEN says, okay, token sales can be money transmission, CFTC is saying they're commodities, right? And, and all of them being mutually exclusive, right? So I think the US is, is actually going to become a bit of a nightmare to run any kind of blockchain startup. And it's interesting the point you made about securities too, because Switzerland is actually a similar thing, right? Where they have kind of clear, you know, pretty clear rules. Okay, this is security, this is not security, and of course that's that. I think it was also one of the main reasons why a lot of uh, projects did token sales from there, right? Because they could basically have this clarity that uh, you know, okay, it's not a security, and also that people don't like later change their mind or that you have some kind of certainty if there's a particular decision made. So yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, so so today at this point, Singapore is still like a popular place to do uh, a token sales, and and do you think that's gonna remain like that? Um, there's a lot going on behind, uh, but in the long run, yes. Uh, I I'm pretty sure from our dialogue and all the conversations, uh, they are very. Uh, I I see it as quite a positive thing that uh, they want the startups here to stay in terms of the blockchain startups, even the ones that do ICOs and stuff. They just want to make sure people are doing it properly that don't violate the existing regulations. Um, so, uh, this, because this is, this is an opportunity. Because if for Access, uh, more just for last year, uh, the Access companies that did ICOs uh, totaled to around $220 million. Uh, of, of ICOs that was raised. And these are just Access members that did ICOs. And because Access has a very, uh, uh, I will call it a unique position. Uh, we're very different from the Chamber of Digital Commerce, even though we're partners. Uh, we focus on grassroots. We focus on the startups and uh, be, uh, be the voice for the startups. Whereas, for example, CDC, they're focusing on the large corporates uh, and uh, uh, working with them to get the blockchain, uh, in a way, uh, in a layman way as to say legitimize, but through the large corporates. We're doing it through the uh, startups that were super small. Now after they do ICOs, they became uh, pretty, uh, pretty big now. And from then, that's how we uh, speak to the government. And they are, uh, government, uh, government, not only the MES, uh, different parts of the government are seeing that 
crypto is a very good potential for Singapore as well. That's really fascinating and, and, and encouraging. So what would you say, I guess, to uh, uh, say a, an American or, or, or a European looking for a favorable jurisdiction to launch their ICO? Like what kind of uh, advice would you give them if they're considering Singapore? Uh, so first is uh, Singapore, uh, definitely if they want to be, uh, be based here, for example, uh, must understand the laws. That, that still is the most uh, important thing. Uh, so if you want, for example, most Europeans would still consider uh, Switzerland as a, as a base for doing ICOs. Uh, but what I'm seeing in the long run where Singapore would move towards to will be quite similar to, uh, to Switzerland uh, in a way where they, uh, the guidelines that come up from the government will be the guideline that everyone would uh, be working towards. Uh, so, to, to answer your question, if Americans and um, Europeans want to come in, definitely we all welcome all the international startups, international blockchain startups. Singapore is here to is, I'm become like an ambassador, which I'm not, not trying to be. But what I'm trying to say is it's actually very, like comparing to the jurisdictions, even in Asia, I think Singapore still is a very favorable place. Uh, as long as you follow uh, what they say, uh, look at the, all the announcements, look at the legislations, uh, and just follow the rules here, basically. So, so should people contact you directly? Should they want to like, no. <laughs> base themselves? In well, they can in be a... part of the community at Access. Uh, we welcome everyone. We have a foreign membership. We have local memberships as well. Uh, and then we have a group for all the, all the different members. Uh, I have to say our members are super helpful, especially for the ones that did ICOs and helping out the ones that are doing. Uh, so we, we do. We do welcome everyone. And for example, the when the Chinese uh, banned the, the ICOs uh, back in September, uh, we do have many more uh, Chinese members joining Access as well. So um, in a way, the more countries that, that different countries ban, seems like it's more favorable for Singapore. But at the same time, we need to make sure Singapore is, uh, the startups here are doing the right thing when they are doing the ICOs and uh, post ICOs as well. So let, let, let's talk about Access a little bit. Um, so you're, you're the chairman of Access. Uh, now, how many, how many members are a part of this organization? So we have over 190 members now and over 100 uh, corporate members in total. Uh, just, just as a comparison, the first year, we only had 10 members. No one wanted to join. No one actually cared what crypto was. And obviously, in 2017, was the, num uh, the number of members actually increased exponentially. Uh, but so uh, we are the voice for the, the whole community. So for example, when uh, governments here, especially MAS, when they need to issue consultation papers, this is the first step before they actually put a, pass a new law uh, in, in the parliament. They would usually ask different industries to see, to give comments. So what Access has done is we have uh, given comments, uh, aggregated all the comments from our members and submitted it to different uh, re uh, regulators to tell them what our association, what our members think. So we are the voice for them. Uh, we are also the, uh, basically trying to get uh, the education up for the layman, uh, working with different partners, local partners here. And obviously, as a whole, promoting every, to everyone the use of uh, blockchain, good use of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So, so you said 190 members, so that's 90 startups. Right, so 100, 100, 100 enterprise members, and then yeah. perhaps 90 startups, is that right? Yes, around, around now it's, it's reached 100 now, yes. So they're individual membership as well. Okay, and so the, these startups, when they come to you, um, are, are, so you mentioned there were Chinese startups uh, that had started flooding into Singapore after ICOs were banned there. Are, are they mostly Singaporean companies or are you seeing a lot of influx coming from outside of the country? So setting up a company in Singapore is actually relatively easy. So many of the, even the Chinese startups set up as a Singapore company to, to, and then uh, get a local membership. Unfortunately, Singapore is a, like, it's a finance center. It's a business center. Anyone can open a company very quickly as long as they follow the, uh, follow the rules. So once they have a uh, uh, company set up, then they can just uh, apply as a, as a local company. But we know that they are actually from China um, setting up their new bases here. And so you said that you had a, a number of partnerships with the Digital Chamber of Commerce and, and, uh, and I believe you're 
personally also a member of the uh, the Singapore FinTech Association, and you have a partnership with them. Yes. Um, you know, as an as an organization that is sprouting up in this in this new space, you know, I I, I assume the Singapore FinTech Association has been around for for quite a while, and they probably had to deal with a lot of the same things that that you're now dealing with in, in terms of uh, in terms of dealing with the regulator specifically. Um, can you can you tell us like what you've learned from them and sort of what types of insights they're providing you as as an organization? Actually, it's the other way. Singapore FinTech Association is actually much younger than us. Uh, they started oh, really? back in um, November 2016. 2016. Yeah. Uh, yes. So it's more like uh, once they first started writing up the constitution, Access actually gave input to them. Uh, so what happened was that there was many different associations. Like there was a, uh, a fintech consortium. There was uh, Next Money. Uh, there were many different fintech associations. And what the... Uh, uh, what we wanted to do as a community is basically consolidate all of them. So yes, fintech associations has been around for a long time, but a single united association only started back in late 2016. But the things that they're going through now, uh, like uh, obviously because fintech is the national agenda, they're working more co closely with the government relatively to what access is uh, on many, many different matters. Uh, how they're interacting with the government, uh, we're learning as well, because I'm also on the board of the FinTech Association as well, which uh, I'm helping to lead the blockchain agenda there. Uh, so in, to answer your question, uh, the things that they're learning, for example, uh, what, how, how, they, how the expansion is done uh, throughout the globe, like uh, FinTech Association has done more than 40 MOUs with multiple FinTech associations and um, I think even... Uh, non-fintech associations as well. Uh, so from there, all, all, all that I'm learning also is where I'm passing along to the access community there. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information, and they don't hold your coins, so you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So one of the stories that came out at some point last year was that Singapore had tokenized the Singapore dollar. Can you talk about, you know, what happened there? You know, what kind of was that project and what do you think will come out of that for the future? So that project is called Project Ubin, U-B-I-N. Uh, I don't know where Ubin came from, but I know some places in Singapore is also called Ubin. So like uh, some small parts of the uh, uh, places they can go in Singapore. Uh, but anyway, so that project is not mainly as uh, easing dollar that is made from that project is not for uh, mainstream use. It's to test for financial settlement uh, between different financial entities. Uh, so in a way, uh, what will come out of it, uh, which it's still not clear. Uh, but the central bank, like the chief fintech officer, Sunendu Mohanty, has said, uh, we will see more mainstream use in uh, we'll see more big uh, use cases for Project Ubin around 2020. So they're still taking the uh, time to do more research and understand what's going on. But yes, the easing dollar that they tested was a chain done on top of Ethereum. Uh, so, uh, but uh, what other use cases that will happen? Uh, we're, not, we're not sure yet. Uh, but easing dollar right now is not for uh, retail use. Okay, but there was use of that between financial institutions or? Uh, yes, so they got multiple banks to come together to, to test uh, the use of it. Yes, uh, so are they actually in uh, alpha beta mode like uh, to test between? Yes, uh, I believe they are. Uh, 
but it's still very tightly knit between uh, the banking institutions themselves. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's still that's still a pretty pretty interesting uh, and pretty cool kind of first attempt. Yeah. What I do think is that it's m maybe for that kind of use case, it, it could happen quite quickly, right? To have some kind of uh, settlement type thing between institutions. I mean, personally, my feeling is for, you know, actual kind of cryptocurrency that like end users will hold issued by central bank that is probably quite far away. Yes. I mean, in a way, I've been thinking like uh, the question, what happens if every central bank issues their own digital currency? So number one in my thought is definitely it won't be just restricted to banks, okay? Because that's, that's the whole point. They want to reach out to more than just the banking institutions. So if all the different central banks started issuing their own, maybe very soon different fintechs can connect to the different uh, uh, central bank currencies and, and do something with it. So in a way, it's actually a, a much better environment for fintechs overall, but it can in my view, it can actually hurt banks if banks don't continue to add value. Because uh, for pr I'm pretty sure these uh, digital currencies, uh, you may need to apply a license or something similar, but definitely it won't be just restricted to banks in the long run. Cool, fantastic. Well, so beyond Singapore, of course, there's a lot of activity in, in different countries as well in Asia. Uh, you know, at one point we heard a lot about South Korea, Japan, China. Can you... Talk a little bit about, you know, what, what do you think is most interesting, which country and that people may not be aware of uh, in terms of what's happening there? Well, um, I think most of us in the worldwide community has been reading the news in China. For example, when we say the Chinese are banning ICOs, kicking out all the exchanges. But it, the, the trend is very interesting where these Chinese exchanges are coming out after the ban and growing even bigger. Uh, than, than before, as we have seen for Binance, uh, OKX, and all that. But overall in Asia, it's a very, very uh, interesting story where we cannot combine a whole Asia as, as one whole ecosystem because uh, China's problems are very different to, for example, Southeast Asia's uh, problems. For, uh, most of the Chinese today are, are banked. Uh, now, if they don't have a bank, they definitely can use uh, Alipay or WeChat Pay to make payments or to store value. Um, uh, Japan is also the same. Uh, Japan has been looking at uh, uh, decentralized currencies actually back then since two, uh, 1999. So I was at um, a workshop with the Asia Development Bank, which the top levels in that, in that bank are uh, Japanese ex-central bankers. And they were saying when Bitcoin came into the scene, uh, it had the right ingredients. They were already in the process of trying to, trying to legitimize Bitcoin, even when uh, uh, Bitcoin was already around 2009. So that, that was Japan. And Korea, as we all know, uh, super tech. <laughs> Anything tech, basically, that's, it will get into the hands of, of the Koreans. Whereas this part of the world in Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore is like an oasis. Uh, more nearly the whole country is banked. Uh, we have more mobile phones per person than uh, in the whole region. Outside, when you just step even into Malaysia, you have at least 40% that don't have bank accounts. And when you step in the whole region, Myanmar, Cambodia in total, there's over 70, 70 odd percent that do not have bank accounts. So that's why blockchain is a use case. Governments here are actually very favorable because they do want to connect all the, all the unbanked. Whereas in China, they already have a very big banking system uh, or a fintech system already in place. Uh, they, they, they will have a different mindset into thinking how to treat the cryptos and the blockchain companies. So you, you can say from, um, in a way, from all the way from China down towards India, it's like a spectrum of uh, very developed countries, fintech wise, and down to super, not developed, which is Southeast Asia and India, for example. So uh, we, we, we basically, even in this region, we learn from the, the Chinese. Uh, a lot of Chinese come here to do the talks. We go to Shanghai to, to meet them. Definitely, they have a lot of uh, new ideas. Uh, and they need a test bed to test all these financial inclusion projects. 
Hence, that's why many of them, even from Japan, are coming into Southeast Asia. Even pre-blockchain days, uh, many Japan VCs are investing in um, Southeast Asia already. Interesting. So this, this sort of ties into to our next topic, which is uh, specifically like your activities and the, the different companies you're, in, you're involved in. So we'll, we'll touch on, on, on each of them. One is uh, CoinPip. So you're the founder and, and CEO of a company uh, called CoinPip. And you're also involved in another project called Sentinel Chain. So we'll also talk about that. And these two projects sort of tie into this idea of, uh, of uh, helping the unbanked, but also payments. So can, can you describe, maybe starting with CoinPip and, and what problems you're solving there, like in, 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 the, uh, in the context of, of, this, of this region, what does the payments infrastructure look like? Uh, you know, especially when you cross borders going from Singapore to like Malaysia or Cambodia or China or any other country in the region? Yes. So this part of the world, Southeast Asia, the payment landscape is super fractured. Uh, for example, you cannot have like PayPal using in all, uh, uh, all the different Southeast Asia countries. Uh, you have, because many people don't have bank accounts. And if you want a PayPal account, you need a bank account to get verified. So um, many different entrepreneurs are trying to find a way to link up the different countries. For example, we have uh, uh, Uber's com competitor, Grab, uh, which is the largest uh, car sharing company in, in Southeast Asia. To me now, I consider them as a fintech company more than a car sharing company because they have a, a wallet that can be used uh, throughout the whole region and partnered with the different banks uh, that uh, are working, working with them. And also listening to uh, Roy, when I worked, uh, Roy, the uh, CEO of Infocorp and Sentinel Chain, uh, it was very obvious to me that the banks are having a hard time to link up the whole region because the, the tech talent is different, very, very sparsely different. The languages are different. It's very hard, hard to link everything. So uh, what CoinPip was trying to do and then Sentinel, it was actually part of this whole story. Uh, CoinPip was trying to serve the underbank. What well, wasn't really the unbanked, but because uh, especially one use case is the travel industry, uh, there are many travel sharing sites. For example, uh, there is a uh, uh, room filler. Uh, X another company similar to Airbnb called Rumorama back then. Uh, they need to send very small payments into uh, Indonesia, Thailand, and so on, because many of them don't have uh, uh, one the the PayPal accounts. So you actually have to wire the money to them. But the amounts can be as small as $30. Okay, so 30 US dollars. And then if you actually do a bank wire 30 US dollars, it's not possible because the fees is already 30 US dollars. Uh, so what CoinPip does is we leverage on cryptocurrencies as a rail, uh, working with the different exchanges. Uh, we are able to find uh, leverage on all the different exchanges, including make, uh, monetizing on the uh, arbitrage, obviously, and then charging the customers on a very low rate. For example, if they want to send $30, we can do it. We only would charge uh, $0.30. Cents. Uh, definitely, you can't do that through the banks. And many of the payments are of this sort of amounts. Uh, and what they only have is a bank account and not extra payment services or added value services on top. And what, what types of customers do you have? Uh, are they mostly like small businesses or where are they located geographically? So to be honest, most of uh, Sing uh, CoinPip's customers are actually Singapore-based uh, international customers. So most of them, for example, are uh, uh, companies that ex exist maybe in Japan, but they want to take advantage of the uh, Southeast Asia market. And so they set up a company here in Singapore, and then we are basically helping them in a way to deploy capital. So the, the money that they send to us, we help them send to their uh, employees in different parts of Southeast Asia, even amounts as small as even $100 sent to their employees and also sent to their, their partners. And the people that are, the, the companies, yes, they are usually small businesses and high growth, high growth startups, especially in the travel industry. Because when you, the travel industry has a big problem with uh, foreign exchange, where most of the recipients, like the partner hotels, boutique hotels, travel experiences, they want to receive local currencies. They do not want to take the risk of a foreign currency. Um, so 
we are able to help them convert into local currency and send straight to their bank account. Uh, but the problem with, obviously, for CoinPip is we can only target people with, with bank accounts, uh, but they're under bank without the services. Here's where Sentinel then comes in, where they can target people without the bank accounts. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's such a you know, straightforward and, uh, and good business, right? We recently did an episode with Elizabeth Rosiella, right, of um, BitPesa. Right? It's quite a similar uh, model, it seems. So there is another project called Sentinel Chain. Can you talk about that? Yes. Uh, so I know Roy for quite a while. Uh, he's been with us uh, since uh, quite early access days. All he talks about, uh, which I, I love about it, is uh, financial inclusion. Because he has been working, uh, he, has, uh, he was the director for doing the payments infrastructure for Singapore. He was also the advisor for the payments, uh, local payments infrastructure for Thailand. Uh, and then he was telling me about all the different problems that he's facing. He, he, was not, he wants to unite the whole region. Even that's what the ASEAN um, uh, countries want to do. But he's saying that from top down, it is very hard to do. In order to actually unite the whole region, you need to go bottom up. And the cheapest way or the most efficient way to go bottom up uh, is to leverage on blockchain technology. Okay? So one of the main use cases here is actually a big population here is also uh, the farmers. Uh, so one of the main use, case, main use cases when I, where I explain to people what Sentinel does uh, uh, is basically where farmers today um, in this region, most of them do not have bank accounts. They either have their normal local cash or they may have a few livestock. For example, a cow, a pig, uh, a goat, and so on. Okay, so what usually happens today is like this. Uh, when a farmer needs to uh, ha um, farm and harvest, let's say it takes them 12 months. Uh, but on the 12th month, they usually don't get the harvest because there may be rain, the soil may turn bad, something goes wrong, and then there may be delays. It's during the delays, that's where the farmers get into serious debt. So what usually happens is they e either go to a loan shark to borrow more money at a very high interest rate, or they have to sell off their livestock at a very low rate, at a market rate, because there's actually no market there to do the, do the exchange. Okay, or even get a, uh, bring the livestock to someone and they can lend you money. There's actually no facilities today. The only thing they can do is if the cow, let's say, is worth $500, they have to sell it for a very low price, uh, e even at a discount of at least uh, 50%, for example. So what this project is trying to do, especially this use case, which is one of many, is that we can actually make uh, tokenize the livestock. For example, we use the cow as an example. Say the cow is worth $500, we make 500 cow tokens out. Okay? Uh, but the farmer only needs 250. So instead of selling the whole, whole cow for the cash, the buyer now can just buy 250 tokens. What he then gets is portion of the milk, portion of the profits from that cow. Uh, so this is a collateralization process. And then afterwards, let's say um, all the harvesting is done, he gets back all the money, he can buy back all the uh, uh, tokens up, and then he can start the whole process again. He doesn't need to pay the profits uh, to, to the buyer. But now what we're not only trying to do is just to help the farmer, but we're linking all the different local communities within Southeast Asia to the whole, as a whole network that can communicate with the crypto world. So basically what we're trying to do is bring the crypto money to help the unbank. Uh, and this is the project that, well, as I see, uh, because we already have projects on the ground that are doing it, that can actually make this happen. So this, this project uh, is, is, being, is being launched by a, a company called Infocorp. And so what, what, are, what are the other types of use cases? You mentioned that uh, this is one use case of many. Uh, can you talk about some of the other applications for Sentinel Chain? Yes. So um, one of the main things, uh, if you understand, uh, I'll explain the context. When we say fintech, we usually just link to payments, uh, which is not true. There is uh, payments, there's wallets. Uh, we also need loans. We also then also need insurance as well. So it's like a whole triangle of um, services, add-value services, in order to... Uh, uh, actually provide the whole framework for them. 
so what, what we also, what this uh, Sentinel chain offers is a B2B marketplace. And we already have some partners that uh, are in insurance, for example, Crowdo, uh, uh, banks that can help out uh, on the loans. Uh, and we also have community projects that can happen. Uh, so um, not only just for uh, collateralization, uh, crowdfunding, uh, insurance, uh, payments, cross-border payments as well. But basically, these are only all the use cases that we only can think of right now. The thing is, because uh, Sentinel Chain is a platform for all the B2Bs, meaning that later on, if another financial service wants to come in and uh, want to target the farmers or the unbanked, they can think of new services and just join, join our community to serve um, uh, these uh, um, unbanked people. Okay, interesting. So we'll, we'll link to the, uh, there's, there's actually a white paper <laughs> called the Cow Chain. <laughs> Cow token, yes. Cow, to cow website, token, yes. Um, which uh, which I was I was skimming through earlier, and it's, it's sort of interesting. Uh, so, can you tell us about you know the sort of state of that project? Um, you know, where where are you at, and what's the roadmap? Okay, so uh, right now we have the projects already on the ground working in uh, Myanmar. Uh, so uh, you can see on the Sentinel Hyphen Chain dot org that site we have uh, we did a demo on how we use the RFID tag on the livestock, uh, on, on, on the actual cow itself. Uh, so we're de developing all these tags. We already signed uh, MOUs with the, uh, the different community owners uh, to get this project started. We also have a project in Singapore itself where uh, if you come to Singapore, you'll see many of these buildings built by people as, uh, from Bangladesh, from Myanmar, from India, for example. Uh, we have this term calling them uh, construction foreign workers. So there's this uh, dormitory that uh, we work with in um, uh, the west part of Singapore uh, called the Tuas Dormitory, where uh, we are going to make the, uh, the whole dormitory cashless. So dormitory is not just for sleeping. What they do is they all the shops, it's like a whole ecosystem there, but just that we, once they finish work, then they actually will go and travel back there to sleep, uh, to sleep and uh, the, the daily things. And so one of the use cases is one of uh, when this whole ecosystem becomes cashless and let's say at home they have uh, the, uh, a family member of the, of the farmstead needs to collateralize uh, a cow, uh, then instead of just sending money to, to them uh, or, or a project that someone they may, they may know of, uh, basically they can leverage on the Sentinel chain, send, uh, send from the uh, blockchain, uh, the Sentinel chain from Singapore into Myanmar, for example. Because the main part of Sentinel chain is that we can actually create multiple small local chains for different communities. And uh, for example, there may be uh, different communities within Indonesia. So there may be three different local chains and those three different local chains can connect to our major main Sentinel chain, uh, send the tokens over to someone in Myanmar, for example. The whole point what Roy wants to do is to make every transaction across, at least across Southeast Asia, to be free. Uh, once it's free, then basically you will have much more commerce done uh, within the, the whole region. So in, in short, to answer your question, what projects we have, uh, it's the, uh, the Tuas Dormitory, which is going on. Uh, Myanmar, which is uh, working with the uh, MOU signed with the insurance and with the different um, community owners there. Uh, we also have uh, projects that uh, we're looking to work into in uh, outside of ASEAN uh, as well, um, uh, Bangladesh, for example. Great, interesting. There's one one topic I want I want to touch uh, on, which is sort of unrelated, but you, you wrote in your blog that um, on I think it was on the CoinPick blog um, that for that you felt that public blockchains. Um, were not necessarily the, the right solutions for financial inclusions, and that I think you wrote that private blockchains would be served for the last sort of the last mile, right? So between uh, the blockchain, the public blockchain, and the um, and the user, could you expand on on your reasoning behind that? So a use case for me myself would be good for public blockchains. I, I can hold Bitcoin, Ether. I actually don't mind the the vol volatility and don't mind spending just based on the public chains. But the thing is, when someone earns an income of $500 or less, which is for most of the um, countries here, 
uh, uh, the rural parts of the countries in Southeast Asia, uh, movement of a single dollar can be quite a lot to them. And so when I say private chains, it's basically having the, uh, the denominator, denominator currency being linked to that local national currency. So for example, it's a e-Indonesia rupiah, uh, where it's uh, uh, backed by uh, real Indonesia rupiahs. Okay, that can be connected to uh, uh, the uh, public chains. Because uh, once it's like this, then they don't need to, they, they already don't have a bank account. So they also need to onboard themselves with, with real like digital currency. And that's already um, education cost there. And then if they have to deal with volatility, that's another step for them to take. So that, that's what I mean. Like uh, for financial inclusion, for the unbanked, uh, public chains are still too volatile. I know I, to me, okay, I, I know a lot of people, I will spur a lot of arguments here today uh, because a lot of people have said that uh, Bitcoin in the long run uh, will become uh, less volatile um, or even cryptocurrencies in, in general in the long, long run. I actually disagree. We have, stock markets here for like over 400 years, uh, we haven't seen that being actually less volatile at all. By definition, because public chains are by the public to actually price what the, uh, what the token is worth, you're bound to have volatility, unless maybe something like Basecoin or Tether or, or something like that. Um, but if it's a free floating coin, you're bound to have volatility. And volatility may be, very too, may be too sensitive for the unbanked. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that's, that's absolutely true, right? Uh, if you have small amounts, then of course, the, the only way that you could have, you know, real mass adoption from public cryptocurrency would probably be some kind of stable coin type thing. Well, I think volatility is reducing, right? It's not as high as it used to be, but it's of course still very high. And I, I agree with you that it will remain you know, substantial and probably more than what many, uh, um, you know, relatively poor people can tolerate. Yeah. So before we, uh, before we wrap up the show here, uh, the, the, I want to talk about uh, a conference and that conference is, uh, decentralized Singapore. And so this is a conference that where I'll be speaking and, uh, where Anson will also be speaking and, um, so Decentralized is a, is a conference that's being organized on uh, April 5th and 6th. It's happening in Singapore. And uh, it will showcase uh, the, blockchain, the blockchain ecosystem in uh, that country and also in the region. So, you know, um, who will attend? Uh, entrepreneurs in the, from the region, also investors, and regulators. And what people can expect to learn there is some of the regulatory aspects, sort of the market dynamics, uh, the applications that are being built uh, in that region um, will be talks about blockchain and AI, uh, blockchain and financial in inclusion. And so if you want to attend that conference, uh, again, it's happening in Singapore on April 5th and 6th, uh, you can go to decentralized.sg. So it's decentralized spelled with a Z. And uh, you can use the code EPIC10, that's E-P-I-C-10, and you will get 10% off early bird tickets and the early bird pricing ends on March 15th. So if you're interested in Singapore, maybe, you know, you're considering Singapore as a, a place where you'd like to do business and you want to, you know, get more involved and, and, and understand the ecosystem a little bit better. Uh, you know, this is a great opportunity for, uh, for you to, uh, to learn more about that country and uh, how potentially you could start your business there. So uh, do, uh, do attend if you can, it would be great to uh, meet uh, some of you there and, uh, and so I'm also really looking forward to meeting you at the conference. And very good food in Singapore as well. Great. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that as well. And I've never, I've never been to Singapore. In fact, I've never been to Asia. So this will be a, a very interesting experience for me. I've been, I've been learning um, all about Singlish on yes. YouTube. <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be able to speak a little bit of Singlish after I leave. Great. So thank you so much for coming on, uh, Anson. It was a great conversation. And uh, again, looking forward to meeting you uh, in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. 
So thank you so much for joining us. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, or wherever you get your podcasts on uh, iOS or Android. You can also watch the videos on YouTube. And if you're interested, we would love it if you would join our community on Gitter. That's epicenter.tv slash Gitter. More and more of you have been uh, joining us there and there's starting to be some conversations. So we're excited about that. And if you want to support the show, of course, the best way to do that is to leave us an iTunes review. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to see your review. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.